All right, listen. Church, I want to say something before we do hold our Bibles up and make a confession this morning. What you hear preached from this pulpit, whether you like me, don't like me, is still the truth in this Word of God. God used a donkey to minister to a prophet, so God can use anybody. And I'm trying to preach just the truth to you. It's not my opinion, it's the truth as far as God gives it to me. And so, don't ever judge God by me. Judge God by His Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright, let's make our confession this morning. Say it like you mean it and ain't like you say it. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. Let's make it personal. And I have what it says I have. And I can be what it says I can be. And I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I'm a winner. And not a whiner. I'm a doer. And not just a hearer. I said I'm a doer. And not just a hearer. In Jesus' name. Right. There's somebody running behind you next to you say, Thank God you brought the rest of my body this morning. Now turn to someone and say, God loves you and so do I. God loves you and so do I. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I feel like I've had a joke week this week. So I need all the love I can get. <laughs> You've been there and done that too, huh? Amen. All right. Church, if you will, turn me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Turn to the Bible say, Mary, I'm going to give Latin medicine, so I got you some medicine this morning. Remember these just humor stories, so please don't be offended by them. <clears throat> Clergyman walking down a country lane sees a young farmer struggling to load a hay back onto a cart after it had fallen off. You look hot, my son, said the cleric. Why don't you just rest a moment and I'll give you a hand? No thanks, said the young man. My father wouldn't like it. Don't be silly, the minister said. Everyone's entitled to a break. Come and have a drink of water. Again, the young man protested his father would be upset. Losing his patience, the clergyman said, Your father must be a real slave driver. Tell me where I can find him and I'll give him a piece of my mind. Well, replied the young farmer, He's under the load of hay. Oh. <laughs> All right. Top ten things you'll never hear a dad say. Number ten. Well, how about that? I'm lost. This looks like we'll have to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> Number nine. You know, Pumpkin, now that you're 13, you'll be ready for unchaperoned, unchaperoned car dates. Won't that be fun? Oh Number eight. I noticed that all your friends have a certain up yours attitude. I like that. I like <laughs> Number seven. Here's, here's a credit card and the keys to my new car. Just go crazy. Oh Number six. What do you mean you want to play football? Figure skating's not good enough for you, son? <laughs> Number five, your mother and I are going away for the weekend. You may not want to consider throwing a party. My kids did that one time. We was at church, come home, let's have a party. <laughs> Number four, well, I don't know what's wrong with your car. Probably one of those doohickey things, you know? That makes it run for or something. Just have it towed to a mechanic and I'll pay for whatever he asks. <laughs> Number three, no son of mine is going to live under this roof without an earring. Now quit your belly aching and let's go to the mall. <laughs> well, I sure wouldn't hear that in my household. <laughs> Number two, what do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want to go and get a job for? I make plenty of money for you to spend. <laughs> Number one, Father's Day. Ah, oh, don't worry about that. It's no big deal. Mm -hmm. All right. As a young preacher, my small church had limited facilities, so we held baptisms in a creek. With alligators in the area, however, that was less than ideal. Then a minister friend suggested I bring my next group of baptismal candidates to his church for a joint baptismal service. Naturally, I accepted. The baptismal pool had a clear front so the congregation could see everything. 
When the baptisms were finished, curtains were drawn, and I was left alone in the pool for a moment. The building had no air conditioning. It was quite hot. I thought, how nice it would feel to take a little dip. <coughs> I glided to one end, turned, and backstroke to the other end. Hearing a, a riotous uproar in the church, I looked toward the congregation. The curtain was down only to the top of the glass. An astonished and amused congregation had been watching my every move. That would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? All right, last one. Lord, we need some humor in the house this morning. Three men worked in the Empire State Building on the 102nd floor. One day the elevator was out of service, so they had to walk up to their office. To pass the time, they decided that one would sing a song, one would tell a joke, and the third would tell a sad story. Each taking a turn every floor until they reached the top. Finally, as they reached the 100th floor, one man sang his last song. As they reached the 101st floor, the second guy told his last joke. And as he ascended to the flight to the 102nd floor, the third man said, I forgot the key. Oh, no. <laughs> that would be a sad story, amen? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in his inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God's the father of the whole family, of all of us, church. He's the head of all things. And it's His desire that we grow into the, the love that He has for us. Most of us, we don't even understand or comprehend the love that God has for us. So many times we think when we mess up, then God stops loving us. And I've told you time and time again, God doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't like what you're doing, but He doesn't stop loving you. Amen. Amen. And because of His love for us, because of the knowledge we have for Him, He's able to do more than we can ever even dream of according to the power that's working in us. Amen. But this morning I want to talk to you about too, have you ever wondered what God thinks of you? Yes. You ever thought about that? What does God think about me? Well, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you said the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end or a future and a hope. God is not against you. God's for you. Even when you mess up the worst that you've ever messed up, God is still for you, church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. It's hard to believe that He loves us as much as the Bible says He does. Amen. God is so big, He sometimes seems so distant. But what is He really like? Amen. Do we really know Him? You've heard His instruction, but do you know anything about His emotions or about His character? Amen. One of the most wonderful revelations of the Bible is that God is our Father. What do you think when you hear the word Father? Do you automatically think of protection and provision and warmth and tenderness? Or does the word Father paint different kinds of pictures for you? God reveals Himself in the Bible as a gentle, forgiving Father intimately involved with each and every detail of our lives. It's not only a beautiful picture, but a true one. However, every person seems to have a different idea of what God is like because they unconsciously tend to attach the feelings and impressions that they have of their earth, own earthly father to the concept of their heavenly father. Each person's own experience of human authority is usually transferred over to how they relate to God. Good experiences bring us closer to knowing and understanding God. <coughs> Just as bad experiences create distorted pictures of our Father's love for us. So many times we judge God because of what we've experienced from our earthly fathers. And it's hard for us to identify with a God that can love us unconditional. What did God have in mind when He created the family? The Bible says in Psalm 68, 6, God makes a home for the lonely. A family involves a circle of relationship, including an adult, male, and female, into which tiny, dependent human beings are born and raised. 
Why do we enter the world such helpless, inadequate persons and then slowly grow up physically, mentally, and emotionally into self-sufficient adults? Have you ever wondered why God didn't come up with some sort of reproduction system that would have produced a physically completed person such as He did with Adam and Eve? Wouldn't it be nice not have to go from the, being a child to the teenage years and into adulthood, just be born and be a, a fully mature person? I believe God wants us to come to this world totally dependent and helpless because He intends a family in it to be a place where His love is demonstrated both to the parent and also to a child. As parents, we begin to really understand God's heart towards us as His children. And as children, it's God's will for us to see His love revealed through parental tenderness, mercy, and discipline. Fathers, we are to represent or imitate God when it comes to our family. He tells us how to handle our children. He tells us how to handle our, our wife, how to love them, how to treat them. And when they see us, they should think of Him. Amen? But what if the ideal did not happen? What if you, you've been failed some way by some parental authority? So many have suffered hurt, rejection by their families that it's hard for them to see God as He really is. Understand that character of God is essential if we're going to love Him. Serve Him and be like Him. Why don't you listen to this? The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. Amen. I'll say that again. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. Amen. A lot of people know about God, but they don't really know God. Yes. Like I said, for me, so many years, when I first raised, or was raised up in church and stuff, I always thought of God as this little white-haired man on the throne, and one of these days, we're all going to stand before Him. And if you messed up, He's there to get you. And that was my idea of a Heavenly Father. But that's not who God is, church. And when you find out He's not there to get you, He's there to lift you up. He's there to pick you up when you fall down. He's there to encourage you. Amen? Amen. There are six different areas of misconception concerning God and His love for us. And a full revelation of God's parental love is incomplete without the presence of the male and the female of parental affection. Every household needs both a male and a female. That's the way God created it to be, church. Children need a, they need a father and they also need a mother. In Genesis 1.27 it says, And God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female. He created them. I want you to look back in your personal past and see if your relationship with God has been hindered in any way because of a failure or because of an absence of the loving care of one or both of your parents. Have you ever turned the driveway of a friend's house to be greeted by the family dog? And the foolish mutt will either cower away from you, trembling with fear, or he'll leap upon you with a display of affection, demonstrated with his tongue, tail, and his dirty paw. The, the browbeaten puppy that cannot be induced to trust you has obviously been mistreated. The mongrel attempting to give you a facial with his tongue has obviously been raised in a loving home. So it is when God approaches man. Our past experiences dictate our response when God reaches out to us. A weeping prophet named Hosea heard the voice of God saying, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sanctified, or they sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Hosea 11, verses 1 through 4. God's authority is not harsh and vindictive, but to the contrary. He's gentle and He's long-suffering. Thank God He's long-suffering. Amen? Amen. Pastor said the other day he rushed into his den needing to, some information from his files. As he sorted frantically through his papers, his five year old son uh, kept blowing his real shrill whistle. He told him again and again to stop. There was a period of silence followed by a deafening blast right next to his ear, including a spray of saliva. He said, I reached around, swatted him with the back of my hand, and, and bellowed at him in anger. Immediately I felt the Spirit of God had been grieved. I remember the biblical statement that God is slow to anger and delights to be merciful. I took my son in my arms and I asked him to forgive me. 
It was only right that I should correct his disobedience, but our children should always know that we discipline them because we love them and not because we're venting our momentary frustration. I know my dad had a real bad uh, anger problem. And sometimes when dad would discipline us, it was not just for our to be disciplined. He got angry and he kind of went to the next step, next level. And as a child, I remember resenting my dad and hating my dad for that. Amen. Amen. Church, they need to know that you're doing it because you do love them. Yes. When I do things to my children, I always come back and try to tell them, I'm doing this because I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't care. But church, our Heavenly Father is being slandered and misrepresented all over the world by man's cruelty and by his selfishness. Amen. Not only in a home, but in all forms of human government. His laws of love have been ignored and our mangled hearts continue only carrying out injustice to all those that are smaller and weaker. And we are. What horror is God seeing at this moment? A bedroom door burst open. A small boy is slapped awake by a drunken, angry man in the middle of the night. The sprinklers are still on. It's a flood. I'll teach you, boy. The terrified child is beaten mercilessly by the dark, hulking shape of man he calls Daddy. A 15-year-old prostitute with blank, empty eyes mechanically performs through a night of degradation on Hollywood Boulevard. She doesn't care what happened to her. She hasn't felt clean since the night she was molested by her own father. You see, a wounded generation stumbles through their youthful years only to visit the same hurts on their children. Hurting people hurt people. Generation after generation it goes on. Is there no one to comfort us? Who will father the children of men? Whose arms are big enough for all the lonely children of the world? Who weeps over our pains? Who will comfort us in our loneliness? Only God. A broken-hearted father who is rejected by the little ones he yearns to heal. A pro our problem is that we, like the brow-beaten puppy, shrink away from the one we assume will be like the other authorities in our lives. But he's not. He's perfect love. So many times when God's trying to reach out to us because of what we've experienced with our earthly father or by some other authority figure in our lives, we respond like we did to them instead of responding to God the way He wants us to respond to Him. And his, it's God who commanded His parents in Ephesians 6, 4, parents don't keep on scolding and nagging your children, making them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with loving discipline that the Lord Himself approves. Every promise of God will be fulfilled. He is consistently loving. His one heart and motive remains the same through time and eternity. He never changes, church. His only desire is to show love and to show forgiveness. My question is, do we distrust God? Our distrust hurts Him deeply, deeply. What if I came home to my wife and my children after a long journey and they run away from me when I open the door and call their names? That would hurt, wouldn't it? You're God's child. And even now, He's calling your name. But maybe deep in your heart, you doubt His faithfulness. As a child, you may have experienced the complete absence of a father because of death or because of divorce. Maybe you were orphaned by the demands of your parents' career. Or it's just a childhood memory of broken promises or neglect that haunts you. Some of you screamed for hours as, baby, but, as babies, but nobody came to relieve you of your discomfort and your hunger. Some of you whimpered behind locked doors, a small child, forgotten and alone. Do you have an inability to sense His presence with you? Is your heart soft towards God or hardened with cynicism and distrust? Look into His eyes and see His love for you. He said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Your earthly father may have abandoned you. Some of the other authority figures in your life may have abandoned you. But God says, I'll never leave you. Amen. I'll never forsake you. And church, I know that's the truth. Even when I try to run from God, He would never leave me alone. No matter how much I ran, no matter how much I got drunk, no matter how high I got, no matter what I did, God was still tugging at my heart, tugging at my heart. You may say to me, but if He loves, love, if he loved me so much, then why haven't I felt Him? Or how, why haven't I seen Him? Church, it isn't God who's failed you. But it's people like me and those who know His love personally. 
Too many times we fail to become His voice and His hands for those who do not know Him. Far too few allow themselves to be driven by the broken heart of Jesus into the dark corners of the world where the poor and the needy wait. You see, Jesus is not attracted to pleasant places, but to hurting people. He pursues us with His love from our first breath breathing moment until the day we die. Your Heavenly Father was there when you first walked as a child. He was there through your hurts and your disappointments. He's present now at this moment. You were briefly loaned to human parents who for a few years were supposed to have showered you with love like His love. But you are always and always will be a child of God made in His image. Your loving Father waits even now with outstretched, outstretched arms. Our question is, what would keep us from Him? What would keep us from a loving Father, a loving God like that? Few people know God the way He wants us to know Him. Many of us are like the thief who died on the cross next to Jesus. Outward, we see a bloody, disfigured body, but soon we begin to perceive the true nature of Jesus. And at the last minute, enter by faith into the family of God. We too must see the past, see past the religious and commercial mutations of Jesus and behold the God of love who still stands with open arms saying, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Who's the God that you have in your heart and your mind? What preconceived ideas do you have of God? When you think, like I said, the word Father, when you think God, what do you think about? 2 Timothy 2.13 says, Even when we are too weak to have any faith in that, He remains faithful to us who are a part of Himself, and He will always carry out His promises to us. Even when we fail, even when we fall short, even when we mess up, God will still fulfill His promises, church. Amen? Amen? <coughs> you know, there was a deal on TV the other day, these kids were playing in a village in the, over in the South Pacific. And they were running and playing in the mud and the Grass huts. You know, these children would very seldom hear the words, don't touch that, leave it alone, be careful. Their homes were simple, consisting of earth floors, thatch roof, and mats that rolled down to serve as walls. In contrast, our modern homes are stuffed with expensive, fragile furnishings and appliances that represent a minefield of potential rejection and rebuke for inquisitive toddlers. How many mothers have exploded and angered a child who has damaged a treasured object of great expense or sentimental value? Children are constantly reminded of the importance of things, their value, and how to care for them. Very few times do they hear the simple words, I love you. A repetitious and destructive chant is working its way into the subconscious mind of our children. Things are more important than I am. Things are more important than me. What are we to do? Abandon our modern homes? No. But we do need to realize that our concept of God's generosity may have been crippled by our childhood experiences. The truth is that God is generous. Creation shows an extravagance of color, complexity, and design that goes far beyond simple function. At this moment, high in the Italian Alps, a tiny white flower glistens in the sunlight. It has never been seen by the human eye in all the seasons of bloom. It is not a central part of the food chain but it was created by God in the hope that one day a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve might glance at it and be blessed by its beauty. The greatest demonstration of God's, fa God's father heart seems to come with his attention to details in our life. He surprises us with those extra things, those little pleasures and treasures that only a father would know we yearn for. God is not stingy. He's not possessive. He's not materialistic. Church, we use people to get things he uses things to bless people. Amen. One missionary said, My family and I have worked as missionaries since 1972, trusting God for our daily needs. Our testimony is that in providing for us, God goes far beyond our basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. We serve a generous God. The psalmist said, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. Psalms 37 verses 3 and 5. Our God is not withholding any good thing from us, church. But just like our children, He's got to train us. He's got to teach us. He's got to prepare us for the things that we're asking God for. 
Just like your child. You, would, you wouldn't give your 10-year-old the keys to your car and say, here, go have a good time. No. You'd want them to learn how to drive and, and do all the things that's necessary to prepare them to be able to take the things. And God's the same way. He's not holding anything back from us, church. He's just trying to get us to a position, a place to where when He does bless us, that we become good stewards of what He blesses us with. Do you have any idea how attractive you are to God? One of the biggest hindrances to our walk with God is our sense that our flesh is repulsive to Him because of our sin. When my grandson's covered with mud, I pick him up and I clean him off with a garden hose. I reject the mud. I don't reject the boy. You've sinned, yes, and you've broken God's heart, but you are still in the center of God's affection. The apple of his eye. It is he who pursues us with a forgiving heart. We say, I found the Lord, but the truth is, he found us. Yes, he did. He found me running from him. Amen. Broken Amen. <laughs> Many children, particularly boys, have had no physical display of affection from their fathers, no real compassion when they're hurt. And because of this false concept of masculinity, we're told, don't cry, son. Boys, don't cry. Jesus is not like that. His compassion and understanding are measureless. He feels our hurts more deeply than we do because of His sensitivity to suffering is so much greater. I was raised with a mother who's a very affectionate person, a very Amen. loving person, yes, a very godly mother. Amen. My dad loved me with all of his heart, but my dad was a worker yes. all the time. My dad was not a person that showed a lot of affection. He did things for you, and that was his way of showing you that he loved you. And one day, my sister had called me. My mom was having trouble with her heart. And we went out there to pray for her. And her heart was racing, and she was really in a bad way. And dad was sitting outside. And we just got through praying for mom, and she was all crying in tears. And, and I walked outside, and I was emotional, and I walked up to my dad. And, and I was trying to tell him, Mom's going to be okay. And I put my arms around him. And him. It was like hugging a wall. There was no response. Does that mean my dad didn't love me? No. Thank God I had a mother that did show affection. And I'm an affectionate person. I'm a loving kind of person. Thank God that she was in my life. But that's just who he was. I, I love him, but that's just who he was. He didn't. And so many men, we're taught men are supposed to be tough. You know, we don't cry. Just suck it up. Be a man. <laughs> Jesus wept, and he's the greatest Amen. man that ever lived. Amen. 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 But because of what our earthly fathers have done, so many times it's hard for us to show our affection. It took God coming into our life to break us. Remake us like Him. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with showing your feelings. Nothing wrong with showing your emotions. Pastor said, once I had to hold my screaming two-year-old while a doctor stitched a large gash in his forehead. He said he quickly forgot his painful experience and fell asleep in his arm. But he said, I was tormented by the experience and grieved for hours. You may have forgotten most of your pain, but God hasn't. He has a perfect recall of every moment of your life. Your fears are still mingled with His, with His at this very moment. God was there when you experienced teasing in the schoolyard. And you walked alone avoiding the eyes of others. He, when you sat down in class confused and dejected, He was with you. At the age of four, when you got lost and wandered, through a huge crowd, it was God who turned the heart of that kind lady who helped you find your mother. Hosea 11, 4 says, I lived in the courts of human kindness with ties of love. Sometimes we don't understand what a fussy father God really is. Your parents may proudly display bronze baby booties on the mantle, pictures in an album, or trophies on the wall, but how does that compare with God's capacity to be overjoyed with your every success? You see, God does not see us as failure. He sees us as successes. Because if we're in Christ, then all victory is ours, church. God sees us as the finished product. Amen? Amen? It was actually God who heard you speak your first real word. 
The hours you spent alone exploring new texture with baby hand were a delight to your Heavenly Father. Some of his greatest treasure are the memories of your childhood laughter. Yes. There has never been another child like you, and there never will be. <clears throat> Moses once invoked a blessing on each of, his, uh, of the tribes of Israel. The one tribe, he said, you shall dwell between the shoulders of God. Man, that's an awesome blessing. But that's where you and I dwell also. Whatever you become in the eyes of men, even a person of great authority, fame, or title, you'll never seek to be more or less than a baby in the arms of God. There's one attribute of God that not even the best parent can hope to imitate. That's the God's ability to be with you at all times. As parents, we just cannot give constant attention 24 hours a day. We're finite beings who can only focus on one thing at a time. Not only is God with you all the time, but He gives you his whole attention. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Let him have all your worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. God cares about you. When you feel like nobody else cares, God still cares about you. God's constantly thinking a stream of loving thoughts towards you as though nobody else in the world exists. And you say, well, how does he, how does he do that? How can he personally involve billions of individuals at the same time? I don't know, but I know it's no problem for the creator of the world. And maybe the explanation is the speed of his thought. There are five billion people on this planet. God has created things in nature that pulsate at incredible, incredible speed. I've heard that quartz crystals molecular, molecular structure vibrates at the speed of nine billion movements per second. If God can only think that fast, he could think a loving thought towards you about twice every second without straining his ability to relate to the rest of his children. Who knows how he does it? Just enjoy it. As far as you're concerned, it's just you and God. You don't have to get his attention. He's already listening. Don't worry about taking his time. It's all ours, church. Maybe your parents were even preoccupied with their activities. Sometimes showed you no interest. Showed no interest in the small events of your life. But God is not that way. He cares. He's a God of detail. The Bible says that God has numbered the hairs of your head. Not because God is concerned with mathematics. He's not a computer wanting data. It's just that He's trying to tell us in what detail He knows us and cares. If He knows how many hairs you're going to hit, He knows everything about your life. Amen. 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 A little boy has worked all afternoon pounding nails into a piece of scrap wood. He finally emerges from the garage and shows a three-level battleship to Mom. He can't wait until Dad gets home. Dad is late. At 6.30, a tired, preoccupied man finally arrives. A cold dinner is waiting and so are the income tax form. The excited boy proudly displays his handiwork to a daddy who barely looks up from the calculator. Daddy never looked, never appreciated, but God did. Amen. Father God always looked, always took delight in the work of your hands. He's your real father. He always will be. Don't ever resent the failings of your human parents. They were just kids that grew up and had kids. Amen. Rather rejoice in the wonderful love of your Father God. We live in a performance-oriented society. Acceptance is always conditional. If you make the football team, if you bring home a good report card, if you look pretty, if you have money, if you win, the kingdom of this world is a kingdom of rejection. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of unconditional love. God's promises are conditional. We must obey Him to see blessing, but His love is unconditional. I want to say that again. God's promises are conditional. You've got to obey Him to see His blessing, but His love is unconditional, church. You don't have to wait to experience the love of God. Just come as you are. Just be honest with Him about your sin. He wants to forgive you. Even the depths of your past rebellion, He still loves you. Even God's judgments are motivated by love. Many of you have an inability to receive God's love and approval. You're trapped in a slave-like relationship with a harsh God of your imagination. A true love relationship involves a giving and receiving of love responses. There's one night I'll always remember, the night I proposed to Joy and asked her to marry me. What if she responded like this? I'll wash your socks, I'll clean your car, I'll top your letters. I didn't want that. 
I want a response that matched my feelings of love for her. I wanted her to know that to know that she felt the same way about me. What is your response to God when He simply says He loves you? Can you be still and know that He's God? Yeah, I know. Psalm 46, verse 10 says, One of the greatest pictures of human peace and contentment is a, a baby asleep in the arms of a mother after having been fed. The child no longer squirms and demands, but rests in the embrace of a loving arms. A deep contentment wells up into the sound of a lullaby sung by mothers at times like this. The prophet Zephaniah described a similar emotion in the heart of God. He will say, He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3.17 <coughs> So don't be so restless in the presence of God. Corey Tim Boom said some of the similar advice to offer this generation. She who experienced so much suffering at the hands of the Nazi, yet went on to great spiritual victory, once said this, Don't wrestle with God. Nestle with God. Amen. That's a profound, simple truth. Amen? Amen. God already loves us, church. Now, all through life, you've had to perform. You've had to compete. Even as a tiny baby, you were compared with other babies. People said, well, you were too fat, or you were too thin, or you had his legs, or you had his nose, or her nose. But God delighted in your uniqueness, and He still does. God wants us to bask in the love of a father. He wants us to rest in His love. Yeah, there's still a lot to be done in our life and through our life. There will be days when God brings deep conviction of sin, showing you areas of your life that need to be changed, that need to be committed, that need to be submitted to Him. But God is not always demanding changes. He knows our limit, and He gives us the grace and the power to do the things He asks of us. He is tender and compassionate. Most of the time, He just says, I love you, and softly speaks your name. If you see that you've been hindered by your relationship with God due to some kind of failure of parental love, then take these things to the Lord. You must find forgiveness in your heart toward anyone who has hurt you. If you don't, your bitterness will consume you and you will find no peace with God. Even God's Word tells you if you bring something to the altar and you have ought against somebody, He says go and make peace with them and then come back to the altar. Realize, too, that you're not alone, church. I haven't met a perfect person yet or a parent who hasn't made a mistake. Everyone has suffered some kind of hurts in life. One of the keys for release is found in forgiveness. The important thing is that you go forward and get to know God for who He really is, not who you think He is. He's the perfect parent. He always disciplines us in love. He's faithful, generous, and kind, just as He loves you and He longs to spend time with you. Think about that the God of eternity, the God that created the universe, wants to spend some time with you. He wants you to receive His love and know that you're special and that you're a unique person to Him. My question is, church, will we receive God's love and affection? Will we open up and enter into an intimate relationship with our true Father? See, He's patiently waiting for you. It's my prayer that we realize His love for us and respond to the Father, God, to His heart. A little sort of saying says, just for today, Father God, just for today, help me walk in the narrow way. Help me stand when I might fall. Lead me the strength. Lend me the strength to hear your call. May my steps be worshipped. May my thoughts be praised. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worshipped. May my thoughts be praised. May my words bring honor to your name. Here I am just for today. Live in me. Have your way. For my desire when this race is run is only to hear you say, Well done. I'm going to read this and I'm closing on this church. It's called being a good father. Today's Father's Day, but I want to tell you about a mother. She wanted to teach her daughter to save, so she gave her two quarters. One of the quarters was to be put in the bank, but the other could be spent. The quarter destined to be saved was immediately dropped in the piggy bank, but the father, the other quarter, what to do with that one? While she was turning over her mind what she should do with it, she started to put the coin in her mouth. The mother, no, mother noticing that 
what she was about to do. She said, honey, don't do that. Taken by surprise, the daughter asked why. Her mother explained, well, first of all, because the quarter's dirty. You don't know who it had it. Second, because of all, the likelihood is covered with germs. Third, the quarter's small and you could choke to death on it. The little girl was deeply impressed. After a few moments, she asked, Mommy, where did you learn all that stuff? Mother replied with a smile, Darling, all mummies know things like that. It's on the mummy test. If you don't know things like that, they flunk you and you don't get to be a mummy. Totally unfazed, the little girl took about two seconds before she asked one last question. And if you flunked a mummy test, then do you have to be a daddy? <laughs> that little girl illustrates the low opinion many people have about fathers in general, and some fathers in particular. TV sitcoms depict dads as being sofa-sitting, beer-guzzling, incompetent idiots, and commercial pictures them as backward buffoons or bungling bigots, totally incapable of understanding wives, children, in-laws, complex family life. Pick up a newspaper, turn on the TV, and you'll learn that the family unit is much weaker today than it was 30 years ago. Amen. And that 50% of all marriages are ending in divorce. Because of this, many are avoiding marriage altogether. Today, the number of couples living together has risen 500%. Many, people, many men are able to sell this bill of goods by saying, Honey, I love you. Uh, I lo a love like ours doesn't need a piece of paper to bless our relationship. And that a trial period of living together will enhance their enhances for a successful marriage. It simply isn't so. Experts say living together before marriage dramatically decrease, increases their chances for breaking up. Some time ago, I ran across a magazine article that told a woman how they could tell if a man was a keeper. Don't bother to count the dozen of roses of a box of candy bring. Forget about he dress, how he dresses or the car he drives. Catch him when he doesn't think he's being watched. See how he drives his car in heavy traffic. Does he lose his temper? Does he break the law? Is he courteous to other drivers and pedestrians? See if he remembers his sister's birthday. The article went on and on. That's the way an outsider gets a glimpse into what, who and what a man really is. If neither father nor mother go to church, only 6% of the children will. If mom goes to church alone, the figure rises to 15%. But if the father goes to church with their children, the number rises to 55%. If both mother and father go to church, the figure rises to 75%. Wow. Fathers, God has given you a children. He's given you a job to do. Share Christ with them. You don't need a further, further sign. Be a father worth having. Amen? Amen. Amen. Church, I want to say one more thing. There was a, a young football player. He was a Dallas Cowboy player eventually. But when he first got drafted, he was drafted number two and he was so excited but all of his life his dad had been really hard he was military he was really really hard on him no matter what he did he never could measure up to his father no matter what he did never made his father seem to be happy about it and even when he, he was drafted number two behind joe namath who was drafted number one the thing his dad said to him how's it feel to be number two so no matter what he did he never could earn his respect or, or the love that he so deeply wanted. And then one day he had a talk with his grandfather. And he found out how his grandfather had treated his father. How he had been abusive and treated him when he was young. And after talking to his grandfather, he had a better understanding of why his father was the way he was. And he had a lot more mercy and a lot more compassion for his father because of what his father had endured. And so many times we we have a hard hurt feelings, a hard feeling toward our father, but we don't know what's happened to them to cause them to be the way they are. We don't know what they've gone through in their childhood. And if we did, we might have a lot more mercy for them also. Amen? Amen. And regardless of how our fathers are treated us, they're still our fathers. And they're the only one you're ever going to have. And God says for us to honor them. He didn't say honor, honor them because they're good or because they're bad. He said honor them. Amen? And so today is Father's Day. And I know y'all got a lot of things going on. I know you got a lot of things on your mind. And I know this wasn't a run and jump and shout message, but I just want to understand. Don't see God through your hurts or through your disappointments with what your earthly father or an earthly authority has done to you. 
See God for who He is. Yes. Let Amen. God be who He really wants to be. Amen. Let Him be the Father that you may never have. Let Him heal the hurts. Let Him heal the wounds. Let Him heal the disappointments. Amen? Amen. Give God praise and praise. Amen. I said some of us may never have a father figure in our life. We don't know how to relate to a God that wants to love you unconditionally. Get to know who He is. If He should say He wants you to come to the knowledge, to know the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of the love God has for us. I thank God He's got an unconditional love church. Thank God I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. We need all the love. We need all the unconditional love we can get. We get need all the mercy and grace that we can get. Just like we show to our kids. There's time I'm sure God would just like to... They need a light in the boat down there. Just like you like sometimes lay hands suddenly on your children. But He still loves us. And He still loves us. He loves us beyond our faults and our shortcomings. And he says, he's not going to change church. He's always going to love you. You can run from him, but you can't hide from him. You go high, he's there. You go low, he's there. No matter where you go, he's there. Amen? Amen. But remember this today. God loves you. He really, genuinely loves you. Not just for who you're going to become or for what you can do for him. He just loves you. Amen? Amen. Give God praise and glory. Amen. You'll stand, church.